Was it me? Mike's are on. Volume's off too, but I'm muted. Does that make a difference? Okay, bitch. Let's try it this way. Okay. Testing? Yep. Okay, we're no longer getting. That's why I always have someone here because it's always something. Try, try again. Try again. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We now have our technical difficulties fixed. I'm calling this special meeting of the Newington Board of Education to order. As you are able, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Okay, we're going to begin tonight with our roll call. Michael Branda. Here. Danielle Drove. Here. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Here. Beth Mankey Hutt-Wagner. Here. Richard Laverrier. I can see him on the call. No, he, he did. He chatted with us. Richard, are you there? Let's see if I see him. Oh, it's me, Margaret. I see his name. He's Amy Parati. Maybe they have to unmute. At 6.03, Anastasia said there is no sound. That was before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sam Sharma. Here. Okay. Jessica Weaver. Here. Anastasia Yap. Here. Amy Parati. Richard Laverrier. Well, we need to hear from them. Yeah, we. Yeah, we have to hear from them audibly. 
said she cannot hear us. They just said they can't hear anything. Have them log out and come back in then, because everybody else is working now. And they may have their computers muted completely, not just the mics. Well, well, yes. Okay, so what we're going to do right now while they're working on their issues, hopefully it gets fixed here real quickly. We're going to open it up now for public participation. Uh, if you are here in person and you want to speak, you're going to be allowed to do that. You can call in by telephone at 860-665-8659, or you can raise your hand in the Zoom meeting and we will call on you. We do limit civil participation to three minutes. So if there's anyone in the room that wishes to participate, you can please come to the table. Hey, I don't see anybody online. We don't have any phone calls coming in. Uh, for the sake of expeditious meetings, we're gonna move on, okay? Hopefully Richard and Amy have got your issues fixed. So at this time, we're going to move on to agenda item C, which is our new business. And right now we're going to have an update on the strategic plan and the board and superintendent goals update. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I think so I can point to the board, I'm gonna relocate myself. Hope that technology serves me well. All right, I'm gonna go to the end of the table, I think it's my best bet. Hello, I can hear you now, sorry about that guys. Very good, so it sounds like we're all in audio range now. All right, good evening board members. Tonight, I wanted to present at least the uh, informational part of my evaluation in public session because I wanted folks who are tuning in from home to hear about all the great work done this school year because what I will share are my goals and the board goals, but they didn't happen in a vacuum and my team around the table tonight, Mr. Friese, Mr. Giacomowitz, Ms. Davis um, are all part of that. I know on the line, we also have Ms. Uh, Freeman and Wendy um, may be joining us later. She had to attend a funeral this evening. So just as a reminder, this portion of the valuation usually happens in May or June, and it's a self-assessment that I do. Um, Part of it will be an exec session, but in terms of the public information I'm sharing, that's what's happening now. Afterwards, when we go into executive session to cover a couple agenda items, the board can ask me any specific questions they want. And eventually the board needs to draft a report. I believe uh, Dr. Fletcher has chosen the authors of that report. And then the final evaluation is presented to me at some point and it is subject to FOI. So that is an important uh, component to understand. So I wanted to start with, and I'm just I'm sure the board noticed around the room, the posters that I've referenced uh, in other board meetings are on the wall here. The posters are representative of all seven schools and each of the posters has on it the goals for the schools, which are all extremely similar. And we will talk tonight about what we've done to attain those goals. So um, feel free to look at those um, at your leisure, but I'll be covering a lot of the information that's on those posters within my comments. One of our big uh, efforts this year is to promote collective efficacy. It's part of our overarching goals, but it's more of a belief system as well because both administration and teacher efficacy is extremely important and many, educational researchers would put, uh, 
agree with this quote that the most valuable resource that all teachers have is each other. Without collaboration, our growth is limited to our own perspectives. And I think those of us that have traveled around the district this year have certainly seen evidence of a high level of collective efficacy. And I wanna tell you, I've seen it at all seven schools in some in varying degrees. And again, things that I'll talk about tonight are the efforts that we're making as a team to grow the district, grow our student achievement. And so the strategies that we have been invoking for the past year are meant to do that. I will tell you, we are going to sh share with you some very good improvements. I will also tell you that we aren't satisfied, that we know we have more to do. We also don't have SBAC results yet. Those are, they're coming in in dribs and drabs, but in terms of analyses, they're not gonna be ready until June or July, well, probably July from what I heard from uh, the State Department of Ed today. But again, we're, our goal is dramatically improve results, especially in light of the pandemic's impact on our kids. Hopefully this is also part of the posters that are around the room, but our mission, and it's not unusual, is to have our students be highly prepared for life after graduation and contributing members of their community. But we also set a mission statement that, that we're gonna cultivate a strong and ongoing partnership with our families and our community to ensure an equitable educational experience for all students. And our educational community will support social, emotional and ac academic growth of all students. NPS students will have a strong voice in their school community and will graduate with a passion for their post-secondary plan with the skills outlined in the portrait of a graduate. And below that is the portrait of a graduate, which again has appeared on these posters. And these posters are in every classroom, in every school, every hallway, every meeting room. We also set a district goal to reduce our achievement gap, especially for those who are historically marginalized and underrepresented. And that is through our access to high quality education that is rig rigorous, relevant, and engaging. And we believe through our theory of action that PLCs were one lever to do that this year because through the PLC work, and I'll define it a little later in my presentation, teachers have an opportunity for that collective efficacy that I referenced earlier. We also set a goal that all teachers would be functioning in their PLCs. And the goal this year was to get to a level five or higher, which I will also define a little bit later in my presentation. Here are the goals that we all agreed to uh, shortly after the beginning of this school year. And uh, they are pretty pragmatic goals because we wanted to increase student achievement across multiple measures. And we did had a lot of different ways we were gonna go about that. We wanted to create or address unfinished learning by equitable educational practices for all students, making sure all students have access to high quality instruction, equitable access, providing structures for our mastery-based learning processes, providing training for administrators and staff on culture responsive teaching practices, and strengthening our partnerships with families and community members to support these goals and developing high functioning PLCs and to continue preschool expansion planning. So now I'm gonna talk about the work that we have done relative to equitable educational practices and high quality instruction access. One of our biggest moves, and it was a very uh, expensive move, but was through the use of the ESSER grant monies. We have added a significant number of staff with the goal of having them enhance our acceleration efforts. So that was the goal of all the people on the next two pages who we hired. And in some cases it was existing staff that we reallocated to a different position. In other cases, it was new staff that we hired. But we have had tremendous success with our coaches at the high school. This is the first time in the history of Newington High that I'm aware of that we have had coaches at the high school. And, you know, I will tell you there was trepidation about it because it's a new concept, but the right people, thank you, Steve and Kim, are on the bus because these, these folks are knocking it out of the park. And I didn't even realize this until the teacher of the year ceremony, but Christine Gamari, who's our STEM coach, was the teacher of the year in Torrington in 2021. And she was a finalist for state teacher of the year. So she is a superstar. Lenny's been with us for a while, but he got repurposed as a humanities coach. The two of them are, are just a, an amazing team. Eileen Francolino has allowed us to expand our credit recovery opportunities 
by doing some work with a platform called Edgenuity. So she, her role got expanded and she's also supports our summer school for credit recovery as well. Lauren Rubo was a reading teacher. I believe you saw her present or at least her team present here at the board meeting a few months ago, back. We enhanced our math intervention services. We added EL positions. The board's well aware of our EL population, which now are called ML, continues to grow. We're close to 9% ML students here in the district. Um, we added an additional case manager at Anna Reynolds and board certified behavior analyst expansion at uh, virtually all of our schools. And just for those of you around the table that don't know, board certified behavior analysts really help teachers develop behavior plans and strategies for children who are struggling in that way. And I will tell you that we have seen behavior struggles significantly this year, more, more than we've ever seen before. And I believe it's a direct link to the pandemic, the anxiety, the stress, as well as students who were mostly remote for a year or more, they had a hard time coming back into the routines of schools. And uh, last but not least, the remaining positions or programs added with this money include another case manager who serves Patterson and Wallace for special ed reasons, our equity and inclusion specialist, Dr. Hairston, and our ESS program expansion at Wallace, that's Effective School Solutions, which the board has seen present before. They've been at the high school in Kellogg for a number of years, but Wallace was a new addition. So mastery-based learning is, excuse me, has been making great strides. And in fact, in many ways, the work of that committee as an isolated committee, not, not an isolated, but a set-aside committee is largely complete. Earlier this year at my mid-year, I shared with the board the timeline of progression of mastery-based learning. And again, this was largely overseen by Kristen Freeman. I know she's on the line tonight, but I wanted just to focus on the, the next, this year and next year as to where we're going with this. And this is very important. And mastery-based learning is a very equitable way of teaching students because you really get to this, the skills that they're still needing and kids can accelerate. So our kids who are coming out of the gate having more skills can accelerate and our kids who are struggling can work toward those uh, standards at, for a longer pace if they need to. So we have provided professional learning com uh, communities with a lot of training that have supported <clears throat> this work. We've also had a district-wide commitment to educational equity and that's some of the work that mastery-based learning has also in, embraced. And you'll see a lot of overlay here, which is intentional. We want the board to see, and the community, and all of our teachers to see how coherent we are. Each program is working toward the same goal with some different strategies. We have introduced the African-American literature courses and the Black and Latino studies courses, highly successful and very popular courses, both full each, each time they were offered. We've done a lot of work with Courageous Conversations, and where that really comes into play is when we're sitting around the table at a meeting, particularly PLCs, and we notice that a student of color or a special needs student or any student is not achieving at high levels, we call it out. We say, could it be because of their circumstances? And I want to be clear with the board, all students, we want all students learning at high levels. We're not forgetting all students, but what we do is if there's a chance that race or disability are playing a role in st students' poor achievement, we do talk about that more transparently than we ever have before. And we'll continue to work on that. We've also worked really diligently through the support of our HCD office and Wendy's office, Kristen's office, about a lot of training relative to culture responsive pedagogy. We've, we're going to, going forward, and you'll hear more about this later, is continue to work on what we've started this year. But one of the things we noticed is we have to kind of fine tune our SRBI process, which is the scientifically based research interventions, which really is, some people think it's, ah, oh, those are the kids that get the extra help. No, it's really a holistic look at our, our tier one instruction, what everyone gets, how are we doing with culturally relevant pedagogy? How do we respond to kids who are not doing well? How do we look at it through uh, an equity lens? So it's a very comprehensive analysis of how we're doing business, and we'll continue to do more of that next year. We'll also continue our Courageous Conversations work next year. 
and educators are learning about what's called the Ready for Rigor framework, which is another way of getting at real equitable educational practices. And then we're going to develop a grade five standards based report card for implementation in 23 24. And in grade six, it'll be 24 25. So the work is ongoing, but we've really gotten a good foothold on it. And now the work of this committee will combine with some other committees and kind of streamline the process a little bit. All right, let me go back into my presentation here. Okay. And again, I, this is sort of a reiteration. I won't go into all the details, but I, because a lot of this I've already covered in the mastery based learning update. But, you know, I think you saw when Steve presented a few weeks back the significant amount of in service work we've done this year. In addition to what's already been mentioned, we've had CREC here and they've worked with all administrators on diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Uh, we've had folks attend a collective, collective efficacy institute. We are developing together with Dr. Hairston's office and the HCD office, a summer equity university. And for those of you that have not seen it, we now have an equity website, which allows folks to not only see our theory of action relative to equity, but also typically there are spotlights during some of the special events throughout the year. We've had Black History Month, Women's History Month, um, autism awareness. Uh, we have a nomination form if folks want to nominate someone for our equity award. We're giving out the first one at our big event on June 14th. So this is just a kind of a hub of all equity resources and some training and other resources. So it's just a, another effort for us to provide this service to our families and our students. And then I want to also spotlight on the next slide how we've used some grant money for other equity activities. In addition to the positions that you already saw, we have um, people that are using different services to expand the work for all of our children. So we have a language line opportunity now, which has really revolutionized how we do business, whether it's a family situation where a parent needs translation at a PPT or at a parent-teacher conference. Last week we had, um, when we did the um, art show, there was a family that needed translation at that. So we use a couple services, but the language line allows you to have on the spot uh, translation. So you could have a parent come into school, you don't even know they're coming, you call this 1-800 number and immediately you can get things translated. We have Jeff Helming ran a program um, at Anna Reynolds strengthening family and community connections with the Everyone's a Writer program, spotlighting some awesome writing activities. And a lot of these things did appear in my reports, my weekly reports. Jen Fries uh, got some training on LGBTQ issues, and then she provided or linked up middle, both middle schools with training in that regard. Our teachers at the elementary level have done some work with two different math platforms, Reflex Math and Dreambox, in an effort to give kids all kids more access to math instruction in a different in different way on a, on a computer, very engaging. Kirsten Devlin at um, Martin Kellogg did some SEL work with a Roots to Rise program, and everyone did SEL work. She just did some some different things to enhance the work at her school. Jesse Dalton, which I believe you saw in one of my updates, ran a family diversity book club exposing all of our families to different authors of different cultural backgrounds. And Paul Kemp um, had initiated a program called Spotlight on Music, which is a really engaging way to get students to learn different aspects of music. So that's, again, the, all of these benefit all children. We've also worked really hard to strengthen our partnerships with families and our community. We are now at the point of developing what's called a welcome center at our high school. We found through our communication with our ML department, um, that we sometimes had our students start school and we didn't know they were ML and they might be sitting in class for a couple of weeks and obviously missing instruction because sometimes parents didn't fill out the paperwork correctly or maybe they didn't understand the paperwork. So we're going to develop what's called a welcome center where we'll have staff, uh, staff, it will be a full-time uh, secretary. She'll be also part of our residency and registration department but she'll also go the extra mile with families 
who might need some referrals. You know, do I need to referral to social services? Do I need a referral to a pediatrician? Because a lot of families struggle with getting their child a physical right away, and that keeps them out of school, or maybe they don't have all their immunizations. So all of those things are going to be available. So we'll have a secretary staffing it full time, and that's an existing position. They'll just expand their role. And then we're going to get a special task where some of our certified staff can provide consult or support to that center. Um, we also have a family and community partnership committee. Two of our board members are on that, Michael Branda and Anastasia Yap. And we'll be continuing to expand the membership of that group. They're planning to do a survey after meeting with Dr. Harrison today. We'll probably do it in the fall. Um, and it'll be a survey that'll be both our families as well as community members to find out what folks' perceptions are of our efforts. We also have, uh, as everyone knows, a big event on June 14th. The board is, of course, cordially invited. Part of that event is, it's different segments going on concurrently, is a session called Coffee Talk. And that will be members of our community coming in to talk about their equity efforts within their um, mission statements. We've got folks coming in from the police department, from our town planning office, from um, one of our local churches, uh, Melanie Enfield from the Congregational Church is going to talk about the work of her church. We also have uh, the Habib family, who you've met a couple of times. That's the young boy that was the impetus behind our adding of Eid al-Fitr to the calendar. Uh, we also have a really great relationship. Our schools have a tremendous relationship with the senior center, which you saw in that senior um, pairing that some of our kids had, that writing group that was in one of my updates, and the food pantry. Many of our schools have done amazing work with food donations this year. Um, you saw that um, Ruth Chafee has a little food pantry now in their front of their school, which the kids are donating to that constantly. And of course, modifying the school calendar, I think was a very goodwill gesture for our community. And I, ever since we've done that, I've been getting a lot of outreach from different organizations. So back to the PLC uh, discussion, we have PLCs, just for folks that aren't familiar with what, it, what they are, is a group of teachers and administrators who meet. And the goal is that they are looking at evidence of student learning. And they're developing strategies to build on strengths and weaknesses. And this is for all children. So a teacher will look at her class holistically, but she'll also look at it, or he will look at it by student individual data. And they'll impact, they'll analyze and implement strategies, see if they're successful or not, and then apply any new knowledge to what they've learned to new strategies. And what's really neat about this process is I might be in Mrs. Jones's class, but I'm in a PLC with my entire grade level. And even if I'm not in your class, other teachers on that team are kind of offering insights. So it's it's not just everyone's focusing on their own class, they're focusing on their whole grade, grade level. And in some cases, from the principal perspective and some other service providers, the whole school. So our goal this year was to get to level five, which is shifting the focus from teaching to learning, really looking at how our kids learning and what are we doing about it, dissecting their work, analyzing the strengths and weaknesses, and then identifying areas for improvement. Um, to preschool, we our status quo for this year, we are, as everyone around the table knows, we're going to move John Patterson over to, excuse me, Anna Reynolds is going to John Patterson for the two years of construction. But I think it bears repeating that we've do almost doubled our enrollment in the last three years in pre-K. And I'll tell you right now, Ruth Chafee is full for the fall already. And that's why if you look under our current programming, we are status quo, but this summer, Lou and I are going to go over and meet with um, Bev Lawrence because at some point we're going to have to open up a second classroom there. Not next year, but hopefully the year after because it is full and it's not even September yet. Part of my role is to show the board what has have been the gains in student achievement this year. Obviously, it still wasn't a typical year, but it was probably the most typical year I've had since I started here with regard to quasi-normal, except there still was a fair amount of quarantining due to COVID, even as recently as this week. But, um, you know, part of the work that we've tried to do this year is support students to help them manage the impact of COVID, accelerate their learning, and support their social-emotional well-being. And again, I've already mentioned how we leveraged our ESSER funds to do that. But now I want to show you some of the fruits of our labors and also, quite frankly, some of the areas that we still have to work on. 
any of these types of uh, programs, and I've done, I went to Harvard back in May for a superintendent retreat, and I heard from a speaker who literally was a superintendent out in um, Wisconsin, and she discussed her work out there, similar to our work right now, and she indicated it took her just about five years to really see that major, major change. I think we'll see changes, you know, incrementally as well, but it was really cool because sometimes you go to these conferences and it's like kind of theoretical and ivory tower-ish, but this individual, she's a professor at Harvard now, but she was a superintendent for, for at least five years and really kind of talked us through from the ground floor up how that all worked. So with the help of Wendy Krauss, I've summarized some of our data for the year. So I, I think you can notice under this uh, bar chart that from the fall benchmark to winter to spring, we made some nice steady increments. And though we had hoped to get to 90 this year was very ambitious, we are very close to 80% in both those areas, which is sort of um, the national norm for any type of um, universal screen. You really wanna get your kids to 80% proficiency on these screeners. So I, I, will be, I think we should be very proud of our pie charts going up pretty significantly. You can see how kids started in the fall and where they landed a few weeks ago. And again, they're still learning since this chart was developed, but um, it is encouraging to see how the kids have gone upwards. Now, this is an important analysis and I'm hoping I can do it justice. This is a Wendy original, but we spoke of it and I think I can explain it. So our goal this year, if this chart were looking the way we wanted it to, it would be either blue or green with no red. So you can see we did that in some areas. Our goal was to decrease the achievement gap for black and Hispanic students as much as we could be. We wanted to get to at least a 5% reduction of the achievement gap. So you can see that in K to four, for black students, we have no significant discrepancy in the area of reading. And in the Hispanic uh, group, however, we did see, an, uh, unfortunately, that gap increased by a little bit, by about two percentage points. In grades five through eight, both for black and Hispanic students, we decreased the achievement gap by 5% or 4%, depending on the column that you're looking at. So here's uh, black students and this is Hispanic students. And in the math subgroup area, we decreased in K-4, we decreased the achievement gap for black students by eight percentage points and for Hispanic students by five. Unfortunately for grades five to eight, it increased slightly. Now, 1% either way is not a big deal, but uh, you know we're still trying to get that to decrease. And that didn't quite hit the mark there, but we are making some strides in a positive direction, but clearly we have more work to do. We also look at, from high, for a high school perspective, since they don't take those same benchmark assessments as the K-8 to students do, we look at failure rate. How do kids do passing their classes? So as you can see, and we looked at it pre-pandemic and post. So during the 2021 school year, we had 6% um, quarter one, 6.7%, 7.4%. .7 so you can see it went up throughout the 2021 school year. Over here um, in 21-22, you can see we've had a much smaller failure rate, but still not, you know, we'd like to be zero uh, and certainly reduced. But ironically, in the uh, gap analysis, we didn't. We saw a similar gap with our black students, but a little bit more for our Hispanic in quarter one and quarter two. Uh, the, they fared better than the uh, general population. Our black students, Hispanic, a little worse. And then in the quarter three, which is sort of the last data point we have, we have a gap analysis of about 0.67 for our black students, which is lower than the general population. But the Hispanic students had a slightly higher than the general population. So. Again, if this were a perfect world, there would not be the gap there or it would be minimal. So again, something that we're still working on for all students. We also ran, we had um, enough grant money left this year. And actually we got some additional grant money that sometimes with the way things are going right now in the state, you just suddenly you're getting this notification of additional grant monies. We decided to run an after school program at the elementary level and middle level and high school level. So we had, 
60 kids at each level, elementary and middle, and they received uh, extended learning time in both academic and SEL uh, areas. And um, we had a good, you know, we had a pretty good attendance there. I think spring is a tough time because you have many competing sports things. The high school ran mostly an SEL and art kind of art therapy, for lack of a better word, program. And that was not as well attended because, again, high school kids have a lot more after school choices. But for those 59 students, we had really good attendance. And I don't have the data yet, but Wendy and I will be looking at that over the summer to see about the impact. But literally, we identified our most highest need students. And they were supposed to, we, they would be invited into school after school to stay about a half hour, 45 minutes to see how they fare, you know, with some individual interventions. All right. And then um, we look at our survey data as another measure. And overall, we're staying pretty steady in a good way. Um, parents largely feel they're getting good communication about their child's grades. We were down just by one percentage point last from 89 to 88%. Um, this one, um, we want people to disagree with, and that it's a good thing. We found that most parents do feel their children are treated equally, regardless of their race. And, um, the schools communicate with parents of diverse backgrounds about what they're hearing, you know, in a way that, that can be understood. And hopefully that speaks to our use of different interpretation strategies, translating a lot of the things that we send home. And then, um, we kind of picked apart the survey question that asked about how parents perceive their children are treated regardless of their race or ethnic background. And you can see that overall, you can see we're very high. And then if you break it down by different subgroups, the area where we are struggling a bit is the perception of our black families. They're only about 76% felt that was true. Hispanic parents felt that was true at about a close to 90% level. And some of our parents didn't disclose their, their ethnic background, so we don't know how they fared or how, what their thoughts were. You know, there is this misperception, too, about um, whether our students of different ethnic backgrounds actually have parents that attend conferences, but the reality is they, they do. We have high participation rates among all of our uh, ethnic groups at, at all conferences. So this, just so you understand this chart, this represents parents who came to three or more conferences throughout the course of this school year, two or one. Zero is a very small number. So I think we, we can uh, take pride in the fact that we are reaching all of our families and they are comfortable coming in for conferences. And um, you know, one of the things we're still working on with teachers is when we initially posed this question about how do you perceive children in your class who are of a different ethnic background? And a lot of times the initial reaction is, well, I'm colorblind. I treat all kids equally. And that sounds good on face value, but in reality, it, they do need to kind of look at, you know, all kids as individuals and whether or not they might eat something different if, if their ethnic background is different. So that's where that question, we're getting a little bit better. You wanted people to disagree with that question, believe it or not. And I know that's kind of confusing. You want people to disagree with a question, but we want people to, to kind of, through our different trainings we've done, you know, I do now understand that I have to kind of look at my class through a cultural lens. Um, yeah, this is... Comp no, it depends on the question. So the top question is um, whether you disagree or strongly disagree. Where there's more data points, this has been survey data for five years. Where there's fewer data points, it's over two years. So the most recent data is in the far right-hand column. Yeah, you're correct. We don't have headers, which would have made it a little bit clearer. But um, so the top line is you know, our goal would be people disagree with that. We don't want teachers to be colorblind. We want them to look at their classroom and look at individual needs. So last year at this time, 36% disagreed with this. Now we're up to 54%. Um, similarly, this is another question that we wanted people to disagree. I try to keep in mind the limits of students' abilities and give them assignments that they can do. In other words, kind of lowering the bar and we want teachers to disagree with that. We don't want you to lower the bar. We want you to find a way to meet students where they're at and kind of raise the bar. So last year, 
disagree with this this year, 25%, still quite a ways to go there. I did want to show this data point, um, teacher perceptions this year, and it didn't surprise me at all based on the kind of year we've had, are that they're not too keen on our discipline system at the school levels. Last year, we had about a 70% approval rating. This year, only about 50%. I will tell you that this has been a really tough year for behaviors. And I think when the behaviors are tough, I think teachers are concerned about the discipline system. I, I have a feeling that that's going to go back up again next year. And again, we are going to put in some other structures to support teachers. But safe to say it was a difficult year um, for student behavior challenges. But we are adding some different programs next year. Uh, the school is sensitive to issues regarding race, gender, sexual orientation. Good news there is there's a high level of agreement there. And then response to events in the world. How comfortable would you be having about conversations with your children about race in the classroom? Most teachers are feeling more comfortable over, the, over time. So uh, I mentioned earlier that our goal this year was to have PLCs operate at a stage five or higher. And uh, right now, we are, many of us, probably, probably all the administrators in the room right now, have observed PLCs uh, consistently at various levels throughout the school year. And um, although the data is still coming in, right now we believe we have about 75% of elementary teachers believe they met or exceeded this goal. And that's up more than 10% from the fall data point. All right. Now it doesn't want to advance again. <laughs> Yep, I'll do it this way. All right. Then um, the last couple of slides are again, we talked about the rounds process. It's very important for our ongoing work, our social emotional learning efforts, <clears throat> the central office PLC work. We actually have our own PLC at the central office level. And we talk about district data, the work at all the PLCs, and we want to, uh, you know, definitely model what we're asking teachers to do. We do it at a, at a different level here in central office. I want to also mention some of the work that I try to do in my efforts as superintendent. I do evaluate all the principals. That, that wasn't the case when I arrived, but I believe it's important for the coherence of all we're trying to do. We did a lot of work this year, both myself with the board about our budget analysis with Lou uh, trying to be as transparent as possible. We developed strategies to save money like the early retirement incentive plan. We've had to leverage the non-lapsing fund to it did reduce our budget asks, the health benefit credit utilization, the um, managing a 0% budget this year, as well as some of the MOUs we're trying to do to collaborate with the town. Um, the tutor versus certified staff reallocation, wherever we can, we would hire a certified staff member versus a tutor, but we also know that we need to expand our para and tutor retention efforts, which we'll talk to the board about momentarily. We also have tried to use our grant money to maximum potential to maximally benefit the students. We've also continued our ongoing security enhancements and capital improvements. And as you can imagine, we've fielded a lot of questions about security since um, most recent events in Texas. I'm also very active in the in the community, both here in Newington, as well as the greater uh, Connecticut community. So here in Newington, I'm a member of Alpha Delta Kappa, which is a, a charitable organization of teachers. Beth Mankey is on there with me. Um, I, we collaborate with Human Services and the Transition Academy. They collaborate with the, the, the Human Services to deliver foods to probably 80 families every couple of weeks in town. I'm a member of the Community Foundation of Greater New Britain, where I learn about some other uh, efforts in our community to enhance people's opportunities. Um, we have formed the Parent and Community Outreach Committee that's still you know, being developed and refined. The promotional video that I sh shared with the board a few months ago that is kind of rolling all over the district right now. And if people come to town hall and wait in the waiting room at our offices, they get to watch the video. Um, I'm fortunate that my ratings from staff and parents about my communication and vision are greater than 95% agreement that that is a, st a strength of, our, of my office. 
Um, hopefully the board feels I've communicated a lot with the weekly updates when you call or email, uh, making sure you are aware of district initiatives. Now tonight I focus a lot on data, but hopefully through the course of the year, you've seen action at our schools. What are some of our points of pride at all of our schools? Um, making sure the board's aware of any changes in state or federal regulations, advising the board on legal implications and notifying the board whenever there's an emergency. I, I wouldn't want you to see an ambulance at a school and not hear it from me about why. Uh, I was nominated by last year's board for uh, superintendent of the year and I was a finalist. And um, leadership standards, I do work really hard together with Bruce and the board to have outreach. Um, Bruce has done a great job outreach with the mayor. I've worked with the town manager on the roof projects and solar panels together with Lou. Um, I've worked with different um, members of the town council and department chairs here at town hall. Parks and Rec collaborates with us on a lot of different issues, the softball field enhancements and some other things out that way. And we're working on some programming next year for our teacher Tuesdays. We work with the police on many issues, training, and they're going to be part of our coffee talk. Town planner and I meet a lot. They're doing a railway project this year that I was on the committee for, but now one of the teachers is on that committee and she's giving them some good advice about how to make it educationally um, relevant for kids to want to go visit it when it's finally developed. We work with the library all the time because of the pandemic. We've worked with emergency services all the time and we work here uh, collectively with the engineer most recently on the John Patterson project, but we're also in uh, consultation with our town engineer about some green efforts, be it green buses or green um, electric charging stations that we're looking at. And I think everyone's very familiar with the Anna Reynolds project. We've provided some updates to the board. It's finally happening. They're packing up this week and they're gonna start shoveling ground the day after school gets out. I am currently the president of the Hartford Area Superintendent Association, though I am gonna be soon to be past president. It's, I'm ha handing over the, the crown. I'm uh, now on the CAPS Executive Board as vice president, CCSU Advisory Committee, adjunct professor. I'm on the CAPS Teaching and Learning Committee as a co-chair. I'm also very active on the CAPS Legislative Committee because I really get a lot of good information about new laws that are coming down or new grant monies. I keep a lot of I'll keep my eye on that all the time. I've been at, I've been appointed to the Reading Leadership Implementation Council by the Commissioner of Education. We have to get every district in the state of Connecticut has to get a reading program that they use approved by the state. And this is the committee that's going to choose which reading programs in the state are meet those standards. So I'm reviewing several reading programs over the next two weeks. And eventually in early July, the state will release the, the names of all the approved reading programs. Uh, each year, I typically have two interns and I think you've met both of them through the course of the year. And I serve on the advisory committee for intergovernmental relations, which keeps me connected to some state legislature folks, as well as different um, governmental and town and board, um, not really town and board, but really government and relationship between government and schools and how to kind of keep at the pulse of that. And next year we will um, continue our work with PLCs, SRBI, the overlay between those two processes, continue with our culture responsive pedagogy, continuing to focus on wellness, both for students and staff. And we have formed a committee with, I think Steve, probably about 10 folks who are interested. And we are opening up a behavior program at Wallace. We're transferring some staff around to support behavior challenges at both schools. Patterson's had a highly successful program for many years, but when the kids leave Patterson, they typically go to a middle school and they don't have that level of support. This program will allow for that. And as I mentioned before, but I think you can't mention it enough that we've done a lot of safety and security enhancements. By the end of the summer, every school will have what we call a man trap where people can't get into the school without having eyes on them at least twice. Every school will have that in place with the exception of Anna Reynolds because it's gonna come as part of the building project. We have had a lot of outreach from Wallace, especially since the um, Texas tragedy occurred. So we're heading over there this week to, I mean, there is, as the board knows, we've put in our capital plan that Wallace needs to be renovated. But, um, you know, until that happens, which is years away, I believe, we have to try to look at some interim steps. So we're going to look at that very soon. And we're, we're looking at our new uh, diagram for next year. This is our 
draft model, but it really, as you can see, PLCs operationalizing with SRBI <clears throat> is really what this is all about. So anyway, that is um, my quick, I guess not so quick, passion, practice, and persistence. It's going to be our mantra. All right, I will stop there. I'll go back to my seat. And if there's any general questions, otherwise we can talk about anything more than that in um, executive session. Okay, Danielle. Oh, I'm sorry, Bruce. I just have a question about your um, I, I your um, website. I went on um, yes for the equity. There's no mention of like, and it's the same. I understand we need to close the. We need to include everyone. There's no mention of Pride Month which I'm disgraced by. There needs to be more training on pride. I went to a National Honor Society um, banquet thing, you know, where they, induction, they referred to he and she. There was never a they. There needs to be a lot more training and it's so focused on one or two areas and you need to do a better job. Okay. I, uh, we, do, we have done a lot of LGBTQ work this year and we're working on a, um, gender neutral bathroom at the high school, but we can certainly expand our work on pronouns. I don't know that we've done a ton of work on that, Steve. I don't know if you would agree with that. Um, would appear that way. You do, you really do. And I noticed it a lot, like just man trap. And I know that's the name of it, but like it's pervasive and everything I go to, I have not heard proper pronouns used for many students and it's so wrong. So, and that's a, a, a a group of students who there's high suicide rates, there's high depression. We need to worry about all students, like you said, and I want to make sure we're doing that. Absolutely. I will tell you that. Uh, oh, my apologies, for Bruce. Using proper pronouns, but clearly if there's, if that larger group presentations, that's not evident, then that's where we have to go with it. So I my, uh, appreciate that feedback. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Fletcher. This is Richard. Can, can do? Can I get? Can I just ask questions? A couple of questions before we go to executive session. Yes, I was just getting ready to call on you. Your hand is up. Go All ahead. Right, thank you. I, I apologize for interrupting procedurally. Uh, um, um, Dr. Brummett, with the so-called man trap or two-factor two uh, entrance authentication, if it's not, if if we're not going to have that at. Um, at Reynolds, can we have a, can we have an officer there to make sure that there's not any uh, additional risks over the next two years? Yes, we do have we have a security officer there, and we do also have a buzz in system, so no one gets in without being buzzed in. However, the um, you know it is not as secure as the schools where you're buzzed in, and then you're in another holding area, and then from there you have to get buzzed in again. So that's where uh, Reynolds is still lacking. But you know, obviously, when we have, and there'll be a lot more um, eyes on the entryway next year, especially because we're under construction. So we are, we do have some other strategies we use to keep it safe. But um, long story short, you know that that's really all we can do right now until the renovation is complete. But we do have that buzzing system, which I think is, you know, a very good system to use. And there is cameras also, so no one comes into a school without being seen on a camera. Well, but perhaps, I, you know, we I would... can, perhaps we can go offline maybe and talk about this in more detail before, because I know we do have to go to executive session, but I did want to chime in with that. Sure. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> Jessica. Oh, I just wanted to thank Daniel for bringing that up and echo it, because I think it is like a huge omission. I think not just as the, as the schools, but also like the town wide. I mean, I think we all could do better, but I think one of the things I wanted to highlight and that'll probably lead into our next agenda item before, but we as a committee talked a lot about that, particularly in our language of our policies. So it's incumbent upon our policy committee as well. And I'm very glad, um, you know, we're, we're the ones on this, but I think in general, um, one of the things too, you know, like AAPI month was it on there. And I think that's been a, we have a huge South Asian population uh, continuously growing. And I think, yeah, I did not see her, no. <laughs> but I think, you know, particularly in the wake of COVID as well, you know, that's been a very jarring issue. And I have, you know, a lot of friends who have experienced that just within the community, not saying within the schools, but I think 
um, to your point, we can always do better, but mm -hmm. I think it's sure. um, something that is really mm -hmm. evident, particularly among um, those of our students that are most vulnerable in, yet yeah, do them. <laughs> do um, I think it's one of those things, particularly in this time. Um, so, but I just wanted to also thank you for the presentation. I think data is really helpful. And I think one of the things we could do is probably ask more questions. Um, I don't think it hurts to ask more questions as much as people hate filling them out. I think it, it would be beneficial. Um, and I just wanted to kind of follow up with that in that lens. I know you did like kind of like a, a survey out to parents and that similar survey um, and just wanting to see how on an annual basis that will be and if those kinds of questions can be included, not just race, gender, ethnicity, really just looking at, you know, the types of um, data points that we're looking at. If we could have more of them, I think it's just beneficial to break down just as we broke it down by race, we could break it down by, by other things. Because I think, you know, when we talked about policies coming up, it's disproportionately impacted by gender usually. Um, you know, those types of things that um, we can just be more conscious of. So I appreciate the surveys a lot. And I just wanted to say thank you for that, particularly to um, these are sorry, I, I will finish my comments, but um, <laughs> should do it, Jessica Weaver um, started uh, evaluating principles. That's really helpful to know. Um, and I think a lot of the public would want to know, you know, what those look like in terms of, you know, people always wonder like, oh, or, you know, we, who's evaluating who, and we evaluate the superintendent, but who's evaluating, you know, those top administrators as well. So um, I did not know our principals were not evaluated before that. So no, no, they were just not by the superintendent. Okay. More of so what I meant. Um, but I appreciate that point and just wanted to say as well to the point of discipline, I think overall, I've heard from teachers across district <laughs> that gave a look that this has been a very difficult year not sure. just district-wide, but statewide, countrywide. Um, and I'm curious to see if we could maybe get more frequent numbers on those things, just because I feel like it it changes all the time and trying to pinpoint those or isolate those impacts um, or you know root causes is going to be difficult, but I would be curious to see um, if there's any change you know, quarter to quarter on that, because um, it just feels like <laughs> overwhelming. I know for you in general, I'm speaking yes, to the choir. it certainly is. It's been a yeah. challenging year. And I will say, talking to my colleagues throughout the state, we have all had right. this experience. So it's one, but it doesn't mean we're going to throw up our hands and say, right. heck with it. What can we do to make it better? Thank you. Um, thank you. So I, I just wanted to look, I guess, at that 49% of teachers um, that felt school <laughs> discipline um, programs um, are effective, only 49%. Right. So kind of coming, you know, anecdotally from, from my own experience as well, I think be, because of due to COVID, um, I think a lot of those behavioral uh, situations are also stemming from some real serious social emotional need that our students have. Um, so I would just be interested, I guess, to see if our teachers, if there is a venue where they, and I mean, perhaps it's, it's a survey, perhaps it's, um, round table of leaders. I'm not really sure, but just to kind of look at some of that behavioral data, where is it happening? How can we target it? What supports can we put in place? Do we need to kind of tighten up transitions to make sure that our kids feel safe? Because I think that our, our students are craving structure right now because it was a year and a half to two years of who knows what's happening the next day. And I think that is a very scary feeling for a kid, whether they'll name it or not. Um, and so I would like to hopefully be able to look at that. Um, and then maybe to, for teachers to say like, why 49%, you know, are you not feeling supported? Are you not feeling heard? What would you do differently? And I think that a lot of teachers um, are just in nature. I think teachers are very like, um, solution focused. So perhaps they have some ideas and I don't know if there's team leaders or some type of a venue where they can come together and kind of put some things in place, like some kind of real consequences, looking at how we're doing restorative, um, to, to set us up and be really proactive for next year. Cause I think this year through no one's fault all over the country, felt reactive. Um, I don't think we knew what we were dealing with as, as educators. And we, I think all educators put in 110% this year and um, only a few days left. Keep <laughs> chugging here. Uh, but then also I, I always just have to plug, and I know that Newington does a great 
job of this, but just making sure that our teachers are cared for, their social emotional needs are cared for as well, um, because it is a heavy lift to make sure that our kids are physically and emotionally safe every day. So at the end of the day, just how are we taking care of our teachers as professionals and as human beings as well, I think is really important. And thank you for all that. I know Newington does a lot of that, um, but just continuing to do that, I just want to put a plug out there because I think it's super important that the human needs of teachers are taken care of too. So. I would agree that that is part of the impetus behind Steve and I forming a committee. And actually, Mr. Brando brought it up at, at a recent board meeting as well. I will tell you before that survey came out, principals already knew it was going to be bad <laughs> because teachers have come to the principals all year long and said, this is just unbelievable. So all year long, we've been trying to make modifications, but you know, there have been councils, there have been different school-based committees. So I think a lot of the principals are starting to look at a different way to do things. And again, similar to our change at the high school with the grade 10 team, some of the other changes that are happening at some of the other schools. So um, my belief is that it will get better next year. But yes, it's certainly not the kind of uh, end point that I'd like to, <laughs> to like to have, no way. Thank you. Um, also, just kind of food for thought as we're going forward, do you think, and I guess this is also a question for you, Mr. Farisi, but do you feel that we need additional um, BCBAs or social workers or counselors or like what can we what can we do to to make she, next year better like 49 percent it just like and I, I know it's felt everywhere but it's it's a tough way to end the year I think and I want to see Newington has some of the best teachers anywhere and I want to see them all return and I want to see them rejuvenated and, and feeling validated and so do we need more manpower, woman, man, human being power? I fix it. That's, that's, that's real life learning people. Um, do we need more human power? I guess, what can we do? I just, this is like big on my mind. I don't know when I want to be proactive and do what I can from this seat. I mean, I'll start and then I'll let Steve certainly answer that. Um, certainly we, some of our bigger challenges this year came up at the middle level. So we are making that behavior program that it's going to be housed at Wallace, but we believe it'll serve both middle Martin Kellogg and Wallace. We did add the BCBAs this year. We knew it was going to be a tough year for behavior. And that's why we added the BCBAs. I mean, I suppose the answer to my opinion would be sure. I'd love more social workers. The high school social workers are maxed. Um, our social workers are busy, our school counselors are busy, our school psychologists are busy. I'd, I'd love more staff, but in lieu of that, I think there's some processing we could do. And then I'll kick it to Mr. Farisi for any thinking he has on it. No, I think that's a, a great way to transition, more processing, more ability to kind of draw the connection uh, between how we do restore and, and get back to a place where everyone feels safe, comfortable, emotionally, you know, um, both staff and students and how we reconnect that through kind of the staff student administration lens and triangulate all that. So I think it is about working more collaboratively, listening to one another and being able to work together to, to improve that throughout the school. So um, I'm certain there are some areas where we could bolster maybe, you know, some efforts if you think about, you know, I do think about certain psychological services that we have and how at some levels it seems to be a little bit less than maybe others. And we might need to reconsider some of that, but I'm not so sure it's all about staffing. Then it is about realigning practice, getting the feedback you're talking about, really listening and trying to implement uh, strategies that continue to work. And also we have to realize, though, that it took time to kind of get here and it is going to take a little time to, to kind of keep working our way back. So I think, I think it's a combination of all that. There's no one targeted answer that I can offer, but I think if we, we continue our efforts and keep our eye on that, I think we have a great opportunity to get there. Uh, Ms. Yup. Um, so I have a question in regards to some things that you maybe Danielle and Beth said, what do we, I understand we're, you know, we put BCBAs in the middle school. What are we going to do in regards to the elementary school? I mean, 
I'm not a teacher, obviously, I'm a banker, but I think on the elementary school level, there are some services that um, have you know, been brought to light to me that we're struggling on. Uh, we don't have enough speech pathologists for children who struggle with speech. I had a parent come up to me today and say that her child couldn't get speech at all because we didn't have the staff for it. And her child is special needs. It's just that they didn't have one for the first grade that could accommodate her child. Why, why is that? If you could have that parent call me, um, because that would be something that is, uh, I, that that's hard for me to rectify with what I understand, but I would, I like to speak to that parent directly because we have, to, if a student's eligible for speech pathology, they have to get that service bottom line. So there has to be something that we need to kind of sort through here. I also, in my own experience, having a child with a severe speech delay, um, and this is my own personal testimony, have fought to get additional speech. And some of the feedback that I've gotten was, I have too many children on my case. So that's feedback that I've gotten, just my personal own testimony. I mean, can we hire more speech pathologists and more BCBAs at the elementary school level? I understand we have budgets, we have things like that, but if we're having some severe behavioral issues, can we add those? I mean, and I don't know how it works. I don't know if they're contracted. I don't know if they're permanent hires. I don't know that. But how do we add that? Early intervention, we always hear is key, correct? And no matter what it is. So why can't we get more of that at the elementary level? Well, we do have BCBAs at the elementary level. In fact, when we added more staff at the secondary level, it gave the staff at the elementary level more room in their caseload to deal with more students. Every elementary school has a social worker. Every elementary school has a school psychologist. Every elementary school has board certified behavior analysts as well as behavior technicians um, that work with children. So um, we analyze our staffing every year relative to our special ed students who might have a mandated service. So we also did add through the special ed grant a little more speech pathology time. So I would, you know, I have not heard from special ed that students were in any way short shrifted, but I can certainly chat with them. And then again, please have that other parent call me so I can I address her concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. I just wanted to quickly add on, um, I don't know in terms of, you know, how often we can do these surveys and quite frankly, I know they can be cumbersome, but in terms of doing that, I think maybe offering an opportunity for qualitative feedback to match the quantitative, maybe that might be helpful in terms of offering some space that we can be able to say, okay, we have the number data and reflect it. I'm just putting on my evaluator hat when I do like, you know, girls programs, I'm like, oh, do these match the, the, just the Likert scale? Like, okay, we just have this, this, and this. Um, maybe that, I mean, again, I'm not saying it's <laughs> the silver bullet, but to best point in terms of just like getting insight from student, from, you know, even students who are struggling, you know, saying like they don't feel X, Y, or Z about, um, you know, their comfortability in school or, or that kind of thing. I think it's important to be able to just get the qualitative aspect of those because sometimes data is, like you said, it, it shows us a 93% here, but then the breakdown shows us different things. So Correct. maybe to be able to, to get a little bit of that um, color. We did do um, a mental health survey for mm -hmm. the students at Newington High School this year. Okay. And Ms. Tigno and I are going to meet with the um, teacher that helped implement that to review the results awesome. and make determination about supports that we might need to add at the high school. I am working with Dr. Hairston to do another survey. That survey does have questions about gender. <laughs> ironically. Um, and we are looking at it for more of a narrative answers to mm -hmm. kind of glean more details. As you know, anyone that's been in the survey world, yep. when parents, anyone looks at a survey, they're going to say, how long is this going to yep. take me to complete? And, you know, that's why we have to kind of balance that out. But this survey that we're still cultivating with an outside folk, uh, consultant will have a combination of um, you know, ratings, but also an opportunity for folks to get put a little narrative. Bless you. Yeah, and I, I know you'll get, you know, response bias and all of that, but I think maybe if, you know, those passionate about the solutions, like you said, will. Absolutely. You know, that's that's one of path. the reasons yeah. why we want to do both parent. It's going to be parent and community. So some of our community partners can kind of chime in about their impressions as well. And, and maybe just to um, follow up finally, um, 
like the amount of surveys you've done is a lot. So just to be able to maybe present that and say how many surveys you've done would be helpful just so we know. Cause I know there's like a million that are out there. Just so maybe <laughs> I'm not asking you to like centralize yeah, it all, but just to be able to say like, we are tracking that and you, you've been able to give us that kind of data to be able to say, you know, this is what we've tracked. You have obviously five years of data for some of those points. I would be helpful to, to have that kind of in a place, maybe on the equity and inclusion site to be able to say, you know, this is what we added. This is when we added more questions, mm-hmm. um, those types of things, just to be able to say like, yeah, we are looking at these things. And if we're not, this is what we will be looking at. You got it. I have a question about your surveys. Thank you. Oh, I need to do it. Maybe. Um, <laughs> Like I, where are these, I like, mean, I read the, the, the principal's update every week religiously looking to see if my kids got student of the month. So I have to go all the way to the bottom. Well played Tara. Uh, <laughs> where are these surveys even coming out? Cause like I saw some of your questions and I'm not saying you haven't, but I have talked to like teachers. I come, some teachers were concerned about like the, the, calendar and they're like I never got that survey I'm like I don't know what to tell you and like we went based on the data we got that's where we're going um same with people in the community with those surveys they're like I never got that and they blew up you know knowing to news I got lots of screenshots about that that um you know well I didn't know that there was a survey and I wouldn't have done that I'm like where are these so where are these surveys so I guess is my question that was like that was a Jessica Weaver question sorry <laughs> the surveys went to parents and teachers and they went out multiple times I believe each principal tells me they sent them out through school messenger at least three times. Yes. So the only reason a parent wouldn't get one is if they don't have an accurate email on file with us. Um, And we do look at error reports too. And I don't think we would see a lot. We didn't see a lot of error reports. So I don't know how parents did not go ahead, Kim, you want to embellish that answer? our principals, we ask them to put it in their newsletters, um, classroom teachers, it will depend on the classroom teacher, but sometimes they put it in their classroom newsletters for parents to fill out. In the past, we've done it during open house, we put kiosks out, unfortunately, we haven't had an in-person, um, not open house, like parent-teacher conference, um, but we do that, and then for staff, we give them time during a faculty meeting to, to fill out the staff survey. Um, to do that in the calendar and, and you know, yeah, you do the best you can to get it out. And are they in like multiple languages and multiple? So like, I, I, so having it on the district, and we had this conversation at our policy meeting. Mm-hmm. Like having it on the district website, yeah. people aren't going on it. <laughs> like they're like, like they're just like so that. And school messenger, like I know I got the, I, I know as a parent I got one because I remember filling it out and it was the one about like. How many conferences have you gone to? I'm the zero. I, I, I didn't want to waste the teacher's time. Um, but there are times that I haven't gotten them and I do have school messengers. So mm-hmm. I just, and I'm not saying, I'm not blaming anyone. I just want to make sure that we are getting data from as many, what's the easiest way to get that data is just, I just want to make sure that we're addressing that at some point, not tonight, but. Yeah. And I will say another um, opportunity that we're going to offer next year. I, I send home all my notifications and the top five languages in the district. If you don't speak that language, you wouldn't get it in that language. You have to kind of select it. Uh, but next year, we're going to switch to a module called Parent Square, which uh, many districts in this area are using. Um, f- some of our uh, administrators from Southington kind of pointed it out to us. So um, that will have a lot more user. I, I know, I'm sorry. My apologies. Um, but we, we do believe that will be another way to get more access. So I, I think we're at the beginning stages of making ourselves as equitable as possible with access to all of our stakeholders. So uh, I think Parent Square is going to be a really good asset for us. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sharma. I've got a quick question for Dr. Pramit. Could, um, when you send these surveys out, do you... Is there, do you track like how many folks responded to these surveys and is it everyone, is it maybe 60%, 70%? I will turn that to Kim. She's our survey analyst. I don't know what the exact number is, but we've had over a thousand um, uh, parent or guardians that are through parent survey. So over a thousand uh, surveys were returned. 
which is about a 25% response rate, which by survey uh, metrics is not bad. It's, it's, it's pretty good actually for return rate. Um, and that goes like, as I said, multiple times. So if you kind of didn't pay attention the first time, you're gonna get it at least two more times directly from school messenger next to your parent square. You so do? 20, so so you get three votes. <laughs> we have three kids, well, two now. 25%, that is correct. And then um, I know I saw a slide. Um, I think there was a survey that you shared about uh, teachers in our district that, I mean, how, if they felt supported. Was Can you just share that slide? What was the percentage of student, uh, teachers that felt um, they were supported by the district? As far as the behaviors not being taken care of, it was 49%. That was like, yeah, so it was 49%. All right. Well, 49%. I, it, that actual question was their confidence level or satisfaction with the school's disciplinary policy. The There was a percentage point about folks and their viewpoint of central office and the superintendent's office. That was a 95% um, satisfaction rate. But I, I think you might've been referring to that discipline data point. Yeah, the 49%. So- 49, um, yes. Maybe the, maybe the next year, next year around maybe, uh, Maybe when you send out the survey, maybe like give them more choices in terms of what, you know, what made them feel like they were not, you know, maybe some, so we can, so we can just get some more data and some more ideas in terms of what's on their mind. Yeah, I probably could already get that for the board. Maybe I'll provide an update because the principals have done a lot of work um, even since these surveys gone out. When, the, like I said, when the surveys went out, they did know the results were going to be problematic because of the way this year has gone and they were making changes ongoing, not just waiting for the survey results. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah. And then in, in terms of the 25% response rate, so maybe next year we could try and do something where you could get like a higher response, um, maybe some out of the box ideas of how we could increase that. So I, I just wanted to share that the um, surveys are disaggregated by school and each school building has their own set of data that their school improvement team looks at. So anything that's rating really low, those are some of the goals that they put in for their school improvement plan. Thank you, Kim. That's okay. a very good point. That's these drive our improvement planning for next year. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Steve? That was it? Okay. All right, very good. It's been a very good discussion, a lot of good questions. So uh, we have to move on here. We have to move into some action items, and then we're going to be going into executive session, and we can further discuss some of these things there if it's necessary. So we're going to go to agenda item C2 at this time. Uh, these are actions on board policies, and I'll give everybody a moment to get those up. Or maybe I'm talking to myself. <laughs> C2. <laughs> let me get that. Okay, so since you're the chair of that committee, I'm going to let you lead the way. Okay, so move the Board of Education approve the revisions to policy 5122, assignment of students to classes as recommended. Second. All right, the motion is made and seconded. Discussion? Questions? Okay, seeing no discussion, I'm gonna ask the clerk to call the roll. Michael Branda. Yes. Danielle Droz. Yes. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Yes. Beth Mankey Hutt Wagner. Yes. Richard Laverriere. Abstain as I'm not familiar with it. Amy Parati. Yes. Kim Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia Yap. Yes. The motion passes eight to zero with one abstained. Eight yes, one abstained. Okay, let's move on to number two. Move the Board of Education approve the revisions to policy 5132 student dress code as recommended. 
Second. Motion is made and seconded. Open for discussion. All right, Mr. Yeah. Laveria. Yes. Um, was there any, um, as to Ms. Drow's comment about the sleeves um, and the shoulders, was that uh, addressed in any subsequent conversations or revisions since our last meeting? Can I address that? Yes, I'm please go ahead and address I'm, that. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what you're referring to for sleeves. I so you were you were so you were saying at the last meeting that you wanted the the shoulders to be covered by sleeves. That came up in conversation, and I agreed with you. And those words were, never came out of my mouth. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. I'm like, I wanted to do halter tops and I got 86 at the thing. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know, I don't know these fashion things. So, like anyway, but like there was some there was some kind of conversation about shoulders and sleeves, no? That was discussion, but uh, if you want to see the policy in its revision, you need to go to the fifth page in this sheet for C2. Okay. Uh, that rough. I don't know what happened here. Nice. There's nothing said about shoulders being covered, nothing about straps. Okay, uh, something about straps. Yeah. Okay. Hit me with one. Okay, so it's it, 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 keep your mind down. Oh, is that where it says don't pose a threat? <laughs> no, <laughs> kidding. So is that a rough one? Um, Students must wear clothing that includes both a top with sleeves or straps. So a tank top would be okay. A shirt would be. So what this idea was, was that you couldn't wear a tube top. Although I wanted everyone 86 to me, a tube top would not be okay. So the straps and the sleeves are in there. That hasn't changed. So it's um, oh, under it's basic dress code 1A. Yes, it's up higher. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Has to have a sleeve or straps, which is it's appropriate. All right. Well, if Danielle's if Danielle's happy with it, then so am I. <laughs> Danielle would actually want more. All right. So, uh, Miss Yop. I have a question. Um, I'm reading A, and I just want a little bit of clarification, maybe from Danielle. So, up sun. So, okay. Obviously, if I the you have a very bad connection. Okay. We're not hearing you. There are shirts. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Switch to okay. Verizon and sleeves. <laughs> Can't hear you. Hold on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. So obviously fashion changes and I see that it says um, on A, we're still on that one, on that it's intended to cover undergarments. So what about, what if they don't wear undergarments? What if it's a type of shirt that doesn't require it? I mean, there's some shirts that um, with obviously with fashion changing that have uh, straps, I mean, uh, like sleeves, but still look tube top-ish. So I'm kind of a little like unclear about that. There are tube tops with sleeves. So is that allowed as long as it covers the breasts? I I'm just asking a real question. We actually did address that in our committee meeting. And one of the conversations that um, Kristen Freeman had with students, she had a panel and she reached out and basically the conversation, the outcome was, you know, there's nothing that says we have to wear bras. Um, kudos to those young people who say that. Um, yeah, I mean, if that's as long as it's not transparent, you can't see through it. If we can't force someone to wear undergarments. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I listen, I, I have a family who are, are in pattern design. So I know, and, I, and, I, and I'm actually worried, to be honest, if you want my opinion, I'm all for fashion. I'm all into it but I know what limits can be pushed. And I just, 
feel it's going to start posing a problem because if I'm wearing a shirt and you know, everyone's all different sizes and I'm not wearing undergarments, but it adheres to your dress code of sleeves and covering my breasts, depending on my size, I mean, I could just see this turning into an issue. I mean, who, who makes the discretion as to what is allowed or not? If I'm looking just at this, I can wear almost anything. And me and Danielle, we did have this discussion in regards to people of different sizes sometimes get treated differently. So I'm not, if I'm wearing the same thing as somebody who's maybe a lot thinner than me, how is that going to work? So can I address that part? And then I'm, and Mr. Fries is going to yes, address please. the other part. So yes. one of the things, and, and I'm very passionate about it and I'm not right. I, I, I appreciated this dress code because I felt like if someone my size, which I'm not on the screen. So people who aren't watching, I am not a small woman. I don't, a teacher has no right to say anything to me as long as I've reached this dress code. And the reality of it is, is larger people tend to get addressed by dress code issues more often because it's more apparent if I chose not to wear an undergarment, <laughs> it would just be apparent. So, um, you know, we, we, we took that into consideration and we said kudos to someone of my stature who felt proud enough to wear certain clothes because the idea of fat shaming and the idea of gender shaming was, was at our forefront. So, um, so I'm going to turn that over to so just, just if I'm allowed to comment. So you're saying that we should have no issues from teachers and staff for women of larger statures adhering to this dress code. I want to make sure this is publicly said because I could see based on, you know, this is drastically different than any other dress code we've had. This happens every day. If I'm, I'm just going to say, if I'm 300 pounds and I'm wearing what you're saying is okay and I'm a lot smaller you're saying that the teachers should not send that student home if it adheres to this dress code. Cause that's what I'm worried about. I understand we're yeah. saying this, but this happens every day to people who aren't of a certain stature. They shouldn't, you know, so this dress code, just to address it. So I, I work in another district and I know a lot of people know where it is, but our, this dress code is very similar to the one for towns that surround us. And the idea behind it really is, is about and if you the whole dress code is about like parental involvement and what a parent so what I and the conversation I had at the meeting was there's a child who is I I would not let my child well now my child dresses however she wants because she's 18 but uh, when she was younger I would never let her dress in that way because of my cultural beliefs and my religious beliefs and my like very conservative nature this other child the thing she wore, I was like, woo. And then I met the mom and I was like, huh, okay, I get it. It's up to the parent, not up to us to make those decisions as to what is appropriate. Now, along that line, this keeps it so that we are not showing anything inappropriate to the public because we don't want to, you know, just like can't go out in public without a shirt on if you happen to identify as a female, which I don't quite get why guys can do it and girls can't, but whatever. Um, so yeah, so we did have those conversations. And is this, and, and, and we, you know, I'm involved in other towns as well as most people know. Um, so we're just addressing if somebody address, uh, um, identifies as a female and a male. And I'm looking on here, transgender and non-conforming. There are people who are identifying as other things. So is that going to be okay as well? Because yeah. I think that should be allowed if this is going to be allowed. Yeah, I, I think to to this point is this whole dress code was made with body inclusivity and you can actually see it. It's actually said in those words. Um, and we talked about the differences of enforcement and how it's been and how we will be equalizing that enforcement. And honestly, this is basically so that everyone, no matter how they identify, will be comfortable in their own skin and what they're wearing. That is the basic goal of this. You can wear what you want within these limits as so long as you're comfortable and we want students and staff to recognize that it is a comfortability, no matter what size, no matter what age, no matter what gender you identify as, that is what this is because it has disproportionately been targeted at a certain gender and has been enforced on a certain gender, particularly at a certain age when bodies are not exactly <laughs> staying the same, they're changing. And we talked about that, particularly, you know, middle school girls, that's a very hard time. 
high school girls, it's a very hard time. Bodies are changing. We're not comfortable. So the point is to be comfortable because when you're at school, your sole purpose is to be learning and socializing, whatever. But that is the goal here. The goal is not to have it distract from others so that you're not comfortable in what you're wearing. And as someone who <laughs> went through body changes, we talked about this and each one of our members was able to talk about this. And, you know, Ms. Rose was very uh, adamant about how, you know, this is very similar to her dress code and there have not been issues. You would think, but quite frankly, if, you know, I'm going off of, you know, we take data from other schools. We did this as well. We consulted the, the guidance department as well, looking at other dress codes from other districts. And you know what? I think this is, you know, I think it's overdue. Um, but I, I certainly believe that this, the main focus of this policy is for body comfortability. Go ahead, Ms. Rose. So to add to answer, I think I, I, I'm not 100% sure your question, but we had a conversation. So there is um, at the high school, and I don't know if those students have graduated, but there were students who identified as furries and they came dressed yes. in tails and one that's of them dressed. And it's fine if that's what they feel comfortable in and they were allowed to do it last year. One of them showed up at graduation with a tail and, and wolf ears, super rock on. If that's what they feel comfortable, you know, it, it goes along with our diversity, right? It's including everyone. So, and then as far as students who identify, I think, you, I don't know what wording you use. Like if you have someone who is biological male who wants to wear a skirt and they identify as female, super rock on. Um, I, I, like I said, I work in a district. I have a lot of students who, you know, have gender fluidity and one day they dress in a skirt and one dress they don't. And it's like super, there's no question. And it really makes the kids feel welcome and comfortable. So that was our impetus to writing it like this. So um, with that, are there gonna be things in place in regards to um, ensuring that the teachers are I mean, this is a huge change for them, right? We've never had this in our school system. Our, you know, our teachers, who are they going to, you know, consult with to say, hey, does this look okay? Or are they going to use their best judgment? So I, I'd be comfortable fielding uh, that question. It's Steve Farisi. Um, so right upon the passage of this policy, that'll be incumbent upon us uh, to engage in professional learning around this matter. Uh, and we, we spoke a lot about that as well. Uh, that this is uh, a variation of, of what is currently in place. And we do need to kind of close that gap with our own understanding and then application of it. So uh, that'll be first on deck as we kind of move into the summer and open for next school year. Thank you. Upon passage of the policy. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Parati. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I fully support this dress code. Um, I think that the, the committee did an excellent job putting it together, you know, very inclusive. Um, the current dress code as it stands is, you know, is biased. And I, I think that it's important that we trust the students and trust the parents to dress in a way that makes them feel comfortable or send their kids to school in a way that makes the student feel comfortable, um, regardless of what that is and who they are and how they want to express themselves. So I 100% support this um, this policy and change and, and I'll be voting yes. And thank you to the committee because I think, you know, I know we talked about last time and you did an excellent job, you know, thinking about everybody and putting it together so that it is fair. And um, yeah, I think that it, it's going to be a good thing for our district. Thank you. All right, uh, Richard Laverriere. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. Um, I just want to say that uh, I do agree in a very small part with what Ms. Weaver said uh, in that uh, we want to make sure that we're making students comfortable, but at the same time, um, you know, there, there, is, there is a fine line between getting out of control. And I do also want to agree with her in another small part, um, specifically, uh, that we want to make sure that we have an, a learning environment that is uh, fostered above everything else. My concern is that if the uh, adjustment to any dress code presents any kind of distractions in the classroom, that's not something that I'm, in, that I'm comfortable being uh, on the forefront of progressiveness with, okay? This dress codes, I went through high school with, with this dress code and so did anybody that's in this room uh, that uh, went to, from, to Newington High School graduated with. 
there's not a significant suppression of rights here. This is the, like, let's be real. This, this, this is about, this is about, uh, yeah. yes, being inclusive, but at the same time, the most important thing here is fostering a learning environment. I, I don't want to get out of control. I don't want to have Instagram, you know, influencing being what's taken over our hallways. I want to have, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. Anastasia, did you have another question? Your no, is... I did not. Okay. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to thank Danielle, Beth, and Jessica, um, and, and Mr. Farisi, and everybody else. But really, as committee members at the board table, I think the passion that, that you brought to this topic and all the other ones, but I think this one was probably one of the toughest challenges. Um, and as I mentioned at the last meeting, as a dad of two girls who are young, who both expressed uh, to me the fact that they felt that the dress code was a little bit biased towards females, uh, I couldn't think of better representatives to be on the committee. So thank you all for your work. All right, thank you. Are you, are you asking me if you can speak? Go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say a lot of this policy making was brought with personal experience in mind. I personally went through a lot in high school, being a short girl with long arms and couldn't buy the shorts I wanted to wear and got yelled at and sat home. And we all had those personal experiences. And this was informed by personal experiences, majority girls who, quite frankly, it, it, it is a traumatizing experience to go walk in front and cry in front of your friends because you got dress code and then have to change your jeans in front of everybody and wear someone else's old pair of jeans because your shorts were too short, even though they were appropriate and your mother would never let you out of the house without this appropriate wear. So um, it saved me for a lot of years too, because it affects your body image, it affects everything. And at a time when that's incredibly sensitive and we talk about mental health, social, emotional learning, all of these things, that is directly tied to that. And it is directly tied to how women are viewed. And I won't go into this whole rant, but it, it truly means a lot that we had the input from uh, students, current, former, and ourselves to be able to say this. Um, both Beth and I went to Newington High School, and I can say we both had those experiences, Danielle giving those personal experiences. So this was not only, you know, data driven, but this was literally our personal stories informing this. So I want to thank the committee for giving their stories. And um, for Steve for listening to our stories <laughs> and incorporating that. And I want to um, look forward to how this will be then um, implemented. We have a lot actually in the policy saying that this has to be implemented fairly. I know there was concern about it being implemented differently in different schools, um, but we will be doing that to appropriately implement it at each level. Um, so thank you for all that put in this work. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your input. I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the question. Michael Branda. Yes. Daniel Droz. Yes. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Yes. Beth Nike Hutton. Yes. Richard Laveria. Uh, no. Amy Karadic. Yes. Pam Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia Yap. Ms. Shop. Move on. Motion passes seven to one. All right, thank you all very much. Now we're going to move on to policy 6146.1. Move the Board of Education approve the revisions to policy 6146.1 grading slash assessment system weighted grades as recommended. Motion's made. Second. Motion has been seconded. It's open for discussion. All right, I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Michael Branda? Yes. Danielle Droz? Yes. Dr. Bruce Fletcher? Yes. Beth Nike Hoffman? Yes. Richard LaBarriere? Yes. 
Amy Parati. Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia Yap. Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Very good. We are now moving on to item number four, policy 6152, the leveling and placement, formerly the grading policy. Move the Board of Education approve the revisions to policy 6152, leveling and placement, formerly grading policy. Motion is made. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Would you please call the roll, Madam Clerk? Brenda. Yes. Daniel Yes. 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 Richard Barbarian. Yes. Amy Parati. Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia. Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Very good. Thank you very much. Number five, policy 6141.52. Move the Board of Education approve new policy 6141.52, challenging curriculum policy as recommended. Motion has been made. Do I have a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Work. I'm not going to second it. <laughs> uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Michael Branda. Yes. Bob Rose. Yes. Back to Bruce Fletcher. Yes. Beth Mankey Hutbagen. Yes. Richard Laverrier. Abstain. I'm not familiar with it. Amy Parati. Yes. Kim Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia Yap. Abstain. I'm not familiar with it as well. Motion is seven with two. Abstain. Yeah. Okay. Number seven. Policy 6172.1. Move. Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. As no, please do. <laughs> Punctual. Okay. Move the Board of Education approve new policy 6172.1 gifted and talented students program as recommended. Motion has been made. Second. And seconded. Open for discussion. Change. Go ahead, I just, Ms. Drost. I would just like to say that these are the policies that were discussed at the last meeting and we're all in the last board packet. So I don't have any questions about them necessarily, but so this one was the one where we talked about, um, what are we on? Gifted, we talked about how this was in response to legislative um, mandates. And there was a lot of conversation about the wording and how, like who was responsible for providing this gifted and talented. So I just want to refresh everyone's memory that that what this one's about. Thank you very much for the update. Uh, Mr. Leverrier. Yes, I'm uh, very supportive of, of the new um, gifted and talented uh, measures. I want to make sure that Connecticut stays away from models that have been brought on by New York. And uh, I'm very pleased with this. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Oh, yes, Ms. Weaver. I just want to clarify, this does not mean we have a gifted and talented program. This just means we have a way of a process of identifying them in the policy by statement that we have to, and that will be addressed in our advanced courses next policy. These bleed into each other, but just want to make it clear that we are not adding a gifted and talented teacher. This is specifically to identify in the process of identifying gifted and talented students. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to know. All right. Uh, Madam Clark, would you please call the roll? Michael Branda. Yes. Danielle Yes. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Yes. Beth Mankey Hutt Wagner. Yes. Richard Laverrier. Yes. Amy Parani. Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Very good. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Num item number eight. 
policy 7551, the naming of facilities. Um, somebody would like to read the motion? Move the Board of Education approve new, sorry, really the new, approve new policy 7551, naming facilities as recommended. Motion has been made. Second. And it has been seconded. Uh, open for discussion. Seeing no discussion, I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Michael Branda. Yes. Danielle Droz. Yes. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Yes. Dr. Jeffrey Hutt-Wagner. Yes. Richard LaVarriere. We did not hear a response, Richard. Amy Parani. Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia Yap. Yes. The motion passed. Yes. Zero. All right. Thank you very much. Dr. Fletcher, we missed one. Yes. I move the Board of Education approve new policy 6141.51 advanced courses as recommended. Did we miss that? I have a Where is it? I got it. I got a birdie in my hand. Here it is. Oh, right. number six. Oh, I have it. I wrote the tally in the wrong place. Please forgive me. Please read it again. Both the Board of Education approved new policy 6141.51 advanced courses as recommended. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, Anastasia Yop. I just have a question, um, if I may address Beth, uh, Dr. Fletcher. Um, is, does this have to do with some of the books that we um, approved uh, or we're looking at for curriculum or is, and for the UConn classes, or is this something different? My, Because um, it says something about the advanced course program, and then some of that was in there. Is that what this is referring to? Am I totally wrong? Can somebody clarify that? No, it's not about any of that. It, it was it, it was about how students are like recommended for the advanced course. And just to kind of give again in the policy meeting, we had a great conversation. There was something that was proposed to us about um, like that students were behavioral and I'm summarizing behaviorally ready. And we had a really rich conversation about um, just it, it was make sure just because a student may be acting up in class. Um, taking away that as a reason to not go into advanced classes. And it was really just more like a prescriptive way to make sure that all students had access. And we were looking at students as a whole to be recommended for these advanced courses. Am I remembering that policy correctly? Right, yeah, if I, if, I was completely off then. Thank you. If I could add, I think it was a part two of our equity work, making sure that all of the students have an access to these really high level, high performing courses and, and have the ability to access that type of high level education should should that be where they um, move forward. And are they gonna, so let's say I have a child who has behavioral issues, but they're extremely, sorry, my dog, um, are extremely gifted. So are there gonna be supports in place for them to be able to you know, be in these classes or how does that work? That's what the whole policy was really, <laughs> that, that's what it's about is to make sure that we aren't asking, excluding. So, yeah. yeah, so they would be. So, um, you know, we had the conversation about, you know, that typical child who sits and is well behaved and just yes ma'ams and does a, you know, a great job and can study and, and regurgitate out the curriculum, um, making sure that we weren't looking at just that kind of a student. We're looking at the student who needs to be challenged, who has the ability and to be pushed. So, yes, those would be in place. Very good, Mr. Laverriere. So my question, just like, oh, sorry. Answer. Sorry, my question wasn't answered. Maybe I didn't ask it correctly. Um, for children who have behavioral issues, 
is there going to be like a pair or something in place to help them, you know, in these programs? That, that's my question. Yeah, they answered the question yes to that and gave an explanation. Okay. There, There is always going to be support if a student has it in their IEP. Correct. They have okay, to have support you. no matter what class they're in. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Leverrier. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Fletcher. Um, I'm not sure who this question goes to, um, but to, I guess uh, whoever. Um, in terms of our equity and inclusion goals, do we have different um, different metrics that we may be evaluating to make sure that we uh, get both the the best students as well as be in, foster an inclusive learning envir environment? Like, what metrics are we using? I suppose for the, our equity goals. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, thoughts? Thoughts? Yeah. We do, I'll, I'll answer that we do track how many children take advanced placement or ECE courses, and we can also cross check that to race, ethnicity, um, gender, and special ed status. Weird. Yeah, and I just want to say in the policy, it states that it's not limited to but inclusive of multiple holistic aspects not just grades but also teacher recommendation parent input student desire um, we wanted to make sure that there's a holistic number and again it's not you know you need to check all these boxes it's you know one or multifaceted um, maybe mr Farisi can read the actual but it's in the actual policy saying what we uh, require of students in order for them to um, be in these advanced courses that's stated in the policy of how we do that. Again, it, it should be multifaceted and holistic. Um, I don't know if he has the exact. I, I do. So indicators like GPA improvement over time, scoring near benchmark on local assessments, uh, student interest in um, persistence, criteria um, not exclusively based on a student's prior academic performance, but using a totality of, of work uh, to date. Um, use of a student's prior academic performance must rely on evidence-based indicators on how a student will perform an advanced course and program. And then um, as Ms. Weaver shared, you know, it's recommendations from a teacher, administrator, school counselors, and other school personnel as well. Very good. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 you've answered my questions. I'm gonna be voting yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sharma. Hey, just a quick question on the gifted and talented program. When when do you um, think it might might it might get started or initiated? Um, so uh, that policy that uh, was just voted on and approved is not going to be to approve a program. Uh, that is going to be to approve the criteria to identify students as gifted and talented. Right. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. In terms of the criteria, like, do you have something? Do you have a framework? Or are you guys going to start working on it? Or correct. Uh, once the policy, well, the policy is approved now. Now we will begin to work on the criteria to implement for next school year. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Miss Yob. Did you have another question, or just leave your hand up? I don't have another question. All right. Thank you. So we're back to policy six one four one. Point five one. Uh, the motion is on the table. I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Michael Branda. Yes. Danielle Burrow. Yes. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Yes. Beth Mackey Yes. Richard Laverriere. Yes. Amy Parani. Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia Yap. <coughs> yes. Motion passed unanimously. Excellent. Now, have I skipped anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Speak <That's> now. <laughs> well, I'm a very detailed person and I miss that. So now I'm going to go home and beat myself up <laughs> tomorrow. Too tired tonight. <laughs> okay. So that concludes item C2. And that is the, um, all right. And then we need to go to item C3, which is 
<clears throat> excuse me, action on the <clears throat> budget transfer for 2021-2022, which is the current school year that we are in, has nothing to do with the future budget. And just a quick synopsis, this is a very standard procedure for this time of year where we make transfers among line items to balance the budget to zero before July 1. Um, so there is a motion there. I will tell you, and I'm going to pop up. There was a error on the one that you received. So we have a corrected copy, both projected on the screen right now, as well as what we're going to pass around. Which I'll ask Ms. Craig to do it for me, if you wouldn't mind. So I will turn it back over to Bruce, Dr. Fletcher, to entertain any questions that folks may have, and Lou is on standby as well. All right, so very good. <clears throat> so are there any questions right now uh, pertaining to C3, item C3? While you're receiving this new one. You're talking about like this in general? Yeah. Had Ms. Trost? Um, it is what it is. I know we need to do it. So <laughs> I just like, and I had that, I had emailed you about the same question. Um, so like when we're like over budget on like something like math, so we're 260. So is that, so next year, did we take into consideration that need when we increased on that budget? Or is that going to come back to bite us again next year? Does that make sense? And I know that that's not an appropriate, like, you know, no. terminology, but I don't know how else to say that. Uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, I do know that we were under budgeted in these items because of the low budget increase we had last year. So they were designed already lower than they should be, knowing that we would have to use the non-lapsing fund. I don't know, Lou, if you wanted to add anything to that discussion. Hey, thank you, Dr. Berman. Uh, the circumstances for next year will be very similar to where we started this year. Uh, everybody can recall when the budget was passed one year ago for 21-22, there was a reliance of $2 million built in on the non-lapsing fund, which was $400,000 each for the five big programs. Okay. In the final motion, uh, a transfer request, we've based it on only utilizing 800,000 of that $2 million. That allows enough money to roll over next year to cover the $2,025,000 we have built into next year's budget. So we have, we're starting essentially the same deficit position. Uh, the factors that allowed us this year to uh, be able to, you know, not need to utilize all $2 million Put us in a position to be able to do it for next year but i have no guarantee or certainty we're going to be able to replicate that again okay. uh does that answer your question no sure. like more uh, yeah. and this it kind of goes along the same things of what i asked i think last week and i apologize that or last week and how am i doing last week i still have covid head i apologize um you know it's this idea of understanding where we're really at with the budget when we start the budget, mm -hmm. right? So this, I'm going to save this one so that next year I'm like, I know exactly where we were kind of mm -hmm. where we were, where we're at. I just want to make sure that when we're going to the budget and I, you know, stay true to my being fiscally conservative, but I also want to make sure that we're providing that we have the evidence to really prove that we need the money. Do you know what I mean? So like mm -hmm. this helps. Right. So like when you're saying we're 800, that we only need 800,000, not the whatever originally planned. So like understanding really where we're at is very helpful. So I just want to make sure that like, so next year, what I'll be kind of, I spying is, you know, we had, again, I like math clearly, um, you know, like we're looking at 4.1 million in the math. Is that what we're going to need again next year in order to keep math status quo? It's not really about the, the required adjustment. It's about what we need. Well, next year in math, you will need that plus your uh, whatever built-in raises right. there are for the staffing costs. And one of the things you need to recognize is that budget is underfunded by $405,000 for each of the five big programs. Right. So you're starting in a $405,000 hole per each of those five. They have to be. Hopefully good things happen 
during bud during the course of the year to mitigate that. But that's not necessarily the case. I mean, even you know, with the you know, looking at gasoline prices right now, those are going to have significant impacts in next year's budget. Yeah, uh, right. That, like along those same lines, like the board of ed budget mm -hmm. is you know under two the board of ed yeah under two hundred and thirty six. Like, will we most likely be under two hundred and thirty six thousand next year? Also, right. No, on that one, we're not that was because of the big bump up in the uh, open choice money to cover the tuitions for okay. uh, the magnet schools. So that's not going to be there. It's a, a zero going into next year. And then, obviously, employee benefits vary. Correct. You had the seven hundred one thousand dollars. I guess my question would have been better of like which ones are they still going to that are lower would would remain lower I guess rather than the ones that are higher. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I noticed we have two people online that have their hands raised right now. But what I would like to do procedurally, uh, I would like to have the motion read, and then we can go into discussion on the motion itself. Here I go. Move the Board of Education authorize the superintendent of schools to make the needed budget transfers, which will reflect, reflect an unencumbered balance of zero, which may include up to 1% of unencumbered funds that will be directed to the surplus account at the end of the 2021-2022 school year. All right, the motion has been made and seconded by Mr. Branda. Now it's open for discussion. Uh, Amy Parati. Amy Hi, I'm Karate. sorry. I was, yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to find my mute button. Um, thank you. So I just, I, Lou kind of answered my question. Um, but is, would it be more helpful? Cause I know that, you know, we're kind of, we're using the non lapsing funds in those salary accounts. Would it be more helpful to kind of have the non lapsing fund as like a separate item and I don't even know if this is possible but or you know at least an, a display that's saying like the math salary really is x amount but we're going to use this amount towards from the non lapsing funds and then this amount we're asking from for the town or for from the town so it's you know so to Danielle's point knowing how much do we have to spend in the math department on salaries versus how much are we spending just because we're using the rest of it to, from um, the non-lapsing funds, if that makes any sense. I think the full, I think what Danielle may be looking for, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking for you, but I think what um, would be maybe helpful to see is um, like a total amount that needs to be in the math budget or the art or um, the other yeah. salaries. Okay. The answer to that is yes, we could do something like that for the board if that's desired. Uh, if you can visualize the financial statement as it's presented right now, uh, your last program at the bottom is community services. One approach we could take is add one more program or line item at the bottom called non-lapsing fund. That would be a negative eight hundred, excuse me, a negative two million twenty-five thousand dollars in looking at next year's uh, financial statement. So the other the other, all the five big programs uh, would be brought up to their total dollar amount uh, or the 100% gross and you'd have that one line item. The management of how that utilization would not happen until the final transfer in June, you know, that would show a zero in the non-lapsing line item all year long until we get to this time when we're settling the books and we'll know exactly how much that is. We would not be drawing down on that during the year. That would provide you the gross number you would be needing to look at by program with that one offset. I would do that just basically as a secondary report to the official version that with all the programs that are here. Um, and that way you could have two looks at it and you'd be able to recognize easily uh, where the uh, money is coming from to um, offset the uh, non-lapsing fund. So we could certainly start that for, you know, the financial report in next year in July. Yeah, and I understand it has to be this way for the official accounts and everything, but I think, yeah, having a secondary report might make it more transparent and just more clear how much we really do need to pay in salaries for each of the five departments and then 
what we're using from our savings. I think that would be um, that would be something very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I just for clarification, I did put up next year's program structure on the display. So what I'm hearing is that we're showing you know this year and next year, but I think it sounds like the board wants to also see how we're leveraging non-lapsing. So we can we can illuminate that yeah. using this chart to maybe further provide clarification. Yep. Yeah. yeah okay. So that's that's something that we can send out soon because we have this ready to go. We just didn't do the offset piece. Thank you. Are well, you welcome, uh, Mr. Sharma? I just had a question for Lou. Um, in terms of like the non-lapsing funds, are we close to like zero when we budget in like for the next next cycle? Next, next year. Okay. Um, as of today, the answer is no. Uh, right now, in the non-lapsing fund, is approximately three million one hundred twenty-nine thousand dollars of value, and I will be drawing down, or in the final reconciliation, I hope exactly eight hundred thousand dollars, which will then leave us uh, a little two point one million dollars available in the non-lapsing fund to address future years' needs. Right now, we have baked into the budget two million twenty-five thousand dollars. So we have a little bit of wiggle room uh, at that point beyond that, but only a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, based on if it all goes according to plan for next year. And then, and then, at, and then, at the, basically at the end of June, when this year ends, right, we we will get like a, a one. We will get like a one percent that's going to go back into the non-lapsing funds based on what's no. left over. Yeah, no, that will not happen this year. Uh, there is no new money going in. If anything, I have to first put back in the eight hundred thousand I'm taking out of the non-lapsing fund. So if I'm able to between now and then save a minimum of eight hundred thousand dollars, then the next dollar and every dollar beyond that I could declare as a surplus. But as of right now, we're just drawing down uh, the non-lapsing balance. Uh, with minimal opportunity to uh, add to the balance at this point. So that means the next budget cycle, we, we cannot really tap into the non-lapsing non fund, right? I mean, we won't have anything to tap into? Well, as of right now, go, if it goes according to plan, right now, $3 million one less $800,000, which is the what this uh, year-end transfer is based on, will be around $2.3 million of available funds in non-lapsing. We are committed to, to balance our budget $2,025,000 to get there. So you'll have $275,000 or so that's available in the fund at that point. And that couldn't cover issues that occur next year. You know, maybe I have the good fortune of being able to chisel away at it a little more and only take 750,000 or 700,000 from the non-lapsing. Every dollar I can save will leave an extra dollar in the fund for next year. So and then be, and then beyond that, like there there might not be something that we could tap into them, right? Not at this point, no. Okay. And then and then in terms of the salary increases, like is it 2.7%? That's like no matter if nothing changes, what goes up? Like two point is it 2.7, 2.8% in terms of like salary, all the contracts we have. I don't think it was that high. I think it was like 2.3. I don't have that information readily at my fingertips here. I'd have to go back and look at that. Yeah, I thought it was. So, yeah, I mean, it'll be a good idea if you can basically the next time around just have that. So so that you know, we all know that hey, if nothing changes, we still oh, for next you know, year we have an increase of two point whatever three percent. That's based on the contracts and the salaries. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. We can, you know, I, I certainly will start doing that work in September for next year. So, yeah, so it just makes it easier, you know, when people yeah. live, you know, in the town and for us. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, any further questions? I'm going to, we'll smooth the question, please. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Michael Brander? Yes. Danielle Droz? Yes. Dr. Bruce Fletcher? Yes. Beth Mankey Hot Wagner? Yes. Richard LaBarriere? Yes. Amy Parati? Yes. Sam Sharma? Yes. Jessica Weaver? Yes. Anastasia Yap? Yes. 
Motion passes unanimously. All right, thank you very much. And that is the final action item for this evening. The next thing that we are going to be doing is uh, going into executive session. Now, two things are gonna happen. We're gonna entertain a motion to go into executive session. Once we do, we have to vacate the room and you have to leave the uh, virtual setting that you're in right now and go to the other link that was sent to you. And then we're going to convene in five minutes. I don't know. We have this young person has been waiting. I don't know. If, are we allowed to move to public participation first? Or well, can we not do that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Jones, were you here to speak? Um, All right. Point, uh, I would have waited until the end to speak, but if I could do that now, that would be appreciated. Yeah, you you All yeah. right. So I will allow for public participation participation at this moment right now. Um, if there's anyone else online that wants to participate as well, we will allow that. Because once we go into executive session, we have no reason to come out in public and vote. So we're just going to adjourn from there. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll give you your three minutes. Uh, um, I just had a, a few things to say, uh, especially based on some of the things that were uh, brought up around uh, LGBTQ plus issues. Um, I am one of the coordinators of the GSA at Newington High School. That's the Gender Sexuality Alliance. Um, and I would like to first thank uh, the work of a few people I've been working with, including uh, uh, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Harrison and uh, teachers who have really cared about this issue and wanted to push it forward and that this issue was raised and talked about now. Um, but I did want to second the idea that there is not enough being done yet. And the people in my community, the people in my GSA, the people I care about and my peers around me do not have access to everything they need to and are not being um, fully served by the district in terms of their identities. Um, it, it's really important that like action happens around this because you, uh, the issue of gender neutral bathrooms was brought up and that is something that's important. And I'm extremely glad that there's action around that. Uh, as it stands, if you are someone who is not male or female or doesn't identify with male or female, you only have one bathroom that is sometimes available that you sometimes can get the key for. And there have been efforts by a lot of people to ensure that that access is there, but it's still one bathroom on the first floor tucked behind uh, like the, the locker rooms. And that, that is an interruption to the learning environment. It, it makes it so that a student on the third floor has to walk down, get there and get back up. And so for that student, it's an issue and it disrupts their learning. Um, also along the lines of like the atmosphere of the school and the curricula as a whole, health classes need to be more inclusive. And I am very appreciative of the efforts that have been made to do that. Um, and I'm glad that those efforts have been made, but as a whole, in regards to all classes, LGBTQ class relationships, identities need to be reflected in, uh, not just when they're directly talked about, but in general, uh, as Secretary Droz brought up, uh, whenever stuff comes out, you very seldom see a singular they used. In the updated dress code policy, which I am extremely glad passed, he or she is used. In the policy itself, which addresses some of these issues, uh, it, at least the version that's in tonight's packet, uses he or she. Um, and that that's just a, a, a cultural issue that like, needs to be discussed when we're talking about anything. And there are basic issues of understanding that are important to keep in mind uh, when the dress code was talked about in terms of like, uh, if uh, there's a, a student who's like assigned male at birth who identifies as female and wants to wear a skirt, they should be allowed to. I completely agree with that. If there's a male student like assigned male at birth who also identifies as male, also wearing a skirt is fine. So basic issues around understanding what gender means to people and the differences between expression and identity and the importance of respecting that, uh, not just not just to like be kind, but also so that students get access to the education that 
Newington Schools provides. I'm a senior, like I'm graduating tomorrow. I will be leaving uh, this district at least for four years. And I, I want those that I care about and that I'm leaving behind to have the best access to that education as possible. So I just wanted to express my thanks for those efforts and that they need to continue. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. I know we're not supposed to respond in there. Yeah, go ahead. So I want to thank you, Jonas, because like, Jonas, like, I we worked really hard and we missed it, and it's really important that that people. I'm sure we missed it. If <laughs> if we're told we missed it, we missed it. But um, and I I to, I have learned so much from my students and from obviously. I'm sure you're guessing my child, right? About understanding. So whenever something is brought up, um, that's a really good point about, you know, it doesn't matter what your gender is if you want to wear it. So I appreciate that feedback. So it makes us grow when we're taught and we're taught by you people, not by us people, because we're clueless. <laughs> so thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So all right, we have no more public participation. So at this time, I will entertain a motion to move into executive session. Motion to move into executive session. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. So we are now in executive session. So that means that we're going to be clearing this room and I'm gonna ask everybody to please leave your Zoom uh, meeting that you have been in. And only board members can attend in this one. And we're inviting Dr. Brummett in. Mr. Farisi and Ms. Davis as well. Oh, and Mr. Farisi and Ms. Davis will be in as well. So we invite you guys to come in. All right, so we're going to be five minutes, and then we will resume our meeting in executive session. Um, well, we got a well, we're not. I'm not so sure you really need to do that. I don't. I don't think so.